Thank you, Mr. Chapman. You're getting ready for song leading at the feast. I know you are. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> he doesn't know it yet, but I know he is. He doesn't know it yet. I just say that because I enjoy listening to him lead songs. Studies in human brain and language development have brought us a lot of discoveries in the last few decades how the human brain operates. And now when we say how the human brain operates, that's according to the medical uh, profession. We all know that we're talking about the human mind as it is distinct from animal brains because of the spirit in man. We understand that. The rest of the world doesn't comprehend or doesn't know that, and so they look at the human brain as having some kind of marvelous ability that animals don't have, even the highest level animals, but we understand that there's something of an element that God gave only human beings of the physical realm. Here's a quote from an article in Healthline.com titled, Men's and Women's Brains Are Wired Differently. But what does that mean? Unquote. That's the title. Uh, here's a quote from the article itself. In one of the largest studies to examine connectivity of the brain, a Dr. Rajini Verma and colleagues at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania have found major differences in the wiring of men's versus women's brains. The continuing scientific evidence shows that our brains are wonderfully differentiated as male and female. Even though the brains of each gender look alike, you can't tell them differently from the outside, there are distinct neurological differences between how the male and the female brains operate. Now let me back up just for a moment to some previous um, medical science that started coming out in the 1960s. It was popularized by psychobiologist Roger W. Sperry. This was going into research about the famous left brain versus right brain hemisphere differences in each individual, left brain and right brain. Uh, according to Sperry's now somewhat dated research, again, this was starting to come out in the 1960s, the left brain hemisphere is more verbal, more analytical, more orderly than the right brain hemisphere. It's sometimes called the digital brain, and it's better at things like reading and writing and computations. The left brain also has strengths in logic, sequencing, sequencing linear thinking, mathematics, facts, and thinking in words. Sperry's research also seemed to reveal that the right brain hemisphere is more visual and intuitive, sometimes referred to as the analog brain, the digital brain on the left, the analog brain on the right. It has a more creative and less structured way of thinking. The strengths are in the areas like imagination, art, rhythm, detecting nonverbal cues, and daydreaming. So <laughs> I'm left hand dominant, probably right brain dominant to a degree. I could daydream all day. <laughs> no, that's not what I do all day, but I, I could. <laughs> I think I could. More recent research has added that whether we're working out a complicated algebraic equation or painting an abstract work of art, both sides of the brain are actually participating in the activity. This is more recent research. It's showing huge differences between our two brain hemispheres, but they don't work independently of each other. There's a lot more that goes on between the two halves whenever we're involved in some activity. Now, let's move on to the unique differences between how the male and the female brains work. There's a beauty in God-ordained intellectual differences between a man and a woman. Taken from Psalm 139, verse 7, just as a, a point to, as far as my introduction here. Psalm 139, verse 7, we'll read it in a few minutes, but David was amazed at 
the differentiation of what God did when he created human beings. And he says how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. And between a male and a female brain, science has shown there's no difference between the genders in any measurable gap of IQ, intelligence quotient. No measurable difference between men and women. And both have the same potential at attaining the glory of God. That's something we understand from the scriptures, from God's revelation. Let's take a look at some of the marvelous intellectual differences between a male and a female that complement each other with an emphasis on womanhood and motherhood. Because after all, we are recognizing this weekend Mother's Day. The title today, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. Now back to this article just for a moment. The article title again, Men's and Women's Brains Are Wired Differently, But What Does It Mean? Science is using a relatively new technique called diffusion magnetic imaging, resonance imaging, DMRI. And a study was done on 949 young people that tracked how different regions of the brain are wired up to each other. Different regions either within each hemisphere or between the two hemisphere, hemispheres. Now, it's the corpus callosum, which is that, that uh, connecting uh, tissue that joins the two halves of the brain, the corpus callosum. Dr. Verma's study found that men have more connections within each hemisphere, within them. Women have more connections across between the two hemispheres. Now, according to the study, greater connectivity within hemispheres helps men to perform single focused uh, tasks while women's Stronger connections between hemispheres would make them better at analysis, reasoning, and multitasking. I'm not seeing any men shake their heads or any women poking their, their husbands. I'm glad. I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see that. Now, women, on the other hand, have a more, I'm sorry, uh, women's, okay, I'm sorry. Women have more connections, again, between the two hemispheres, allowing the two halves of the brain to share information more easily. Now, this notion is supported by another study, a different study involving 3,500 people ages eight years old to 21 years old. The study found that women perform better at attention, word and facial memory, and social tasks Men, on the other hand, perform better at spatial processing and eye-to-hand or eye-hand coordination tasks. Now, these are generalities. These don't uh, affect every single male and female on Earth, but they're generalities uh, where their strengths generally lie. A woman's brain acts more like a computer. She can give you a quick answer, but not always able to describe or map out in a linear fashion how she got from point A to point B. She can't always describe all the steps in between that helped her to come to a conclusion on a matter. We have a name for that kind of logical processing. It's called women's intuition. Or you ask a woman, how did you arrive at that, that reasoning or that conclusion? And she might say, well, just because. <laughs> There's some, something going on in between there, but it's because of the connectedness between the two hemispheres that she's able to do this. Generally, a woman can assess a conclusion more quickly than a male can, again, though not consciously thinking about the steps it took to get to her conclusion. This is a wonderful gift of the feminine mind that men are often very perplexed about, and it's true. Why do women have this uh, ability? Uh, once again, it's the connectedness between the two brain hemispheres, the lateral transmission between the left and right hemispheres through the corpus callosum. In some cases, this can be a wonderful advantage. By this difference, a woman can consult 
all her past experience and give you that instant response. And this is, again, a little more intuitive, more global than usually how a man processes information to come to a conclusion. The male, though, tends to operate with the ability that can be to his advantage. He can show you how he got, again, linearly to his conclusion on a, on a given matter. It usually takes a, a bit longer, but he can show you step by step how he mapped out his conclusion. So the female can show you her conclusion, which is no less logical than a man's, but a man can map his out as a rule. If you ask her once again how she arrived at, arrived at her conclusions, women's intuition. Now, the family of humanity would not be complete without both genders, both sexes. Every family needs both of these mental processes, the male dominance in the logical and analytical realm, the female dominance in the affective and emotional aff uh, connectedness. When both a man and a woman work together and are in harmony in a marriage, wonderful, rewarding results can happen. Now, it doesn't mean that a man can't live alone without a woman or a woman can't live alone without a man. I'm just saying within a marriage, God designed it this way, that there's harmony between the two different ways that men and women think and process information. Please turn to Genesis 1, verse 26 with me. Genesis 1 and verse 26. And as you're turning here, it's clearly stated that whatever the image of God entails when God said what we're going to read in a moment, it has something to do with God creating male and female. Now we see throughout the whole Bible that God, the Father, the Word actually is the one who spoke in ages past. The Word who became Jesus Christ was the spokesperson that spoke to Moses, spoke to the prophets, spoke at Mount Sinai, and bellowed out the Ten Commandments for all the children of Israel to hear. That was the Word. It is so often the case in the Bible that God is, uh, uh, shows male attributes. He's masculine in his nature in most cases, but we're going to see some interesting things here on the opposite of that in a few moments. The beauty in both the male and the female being formed in God's image is where God took part of who he was, is and put it in the man's personality and his mental makeup and part of who he is and put it in the women's personality and mental makeup. Again, we see when the two work together, man and woman, in a harmonious relationship, there's wonderful things that God uh, has provided by design. Let's read Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him man, male and female. He created him. Now it says him, but he created mankind. Now the different uh, translations, the RSV, ASV, uh, American Standard Version, and NIV calls out man, but a lot of translations say mankind. Let's turn over to Genesis 5, verse 2. Genesis 5, verse 2, this is made quite clear again. This thought was reintroduced again when Adam and Eve were pushed out of the Garden of Eden. Verse 2, he created them, male and female, and he blessed them, and he called them mankind in the day that he created them. Humanity, humankind, other words for the same thing. So the word man or mankind or humankind, there are many translations, but we can see clearly that God is speaking of men and women to make up mankind or humanity. Let's get back again to Genesis 2 and verse 20. Genesis 2 and verse 20. 
Here we see the helper God was going to make for the male. Verse 20. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him or compatible for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept, and God took out one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. God used part of Adam to create a helper for him, and so the beginning of male and female of the human species. Adam says, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And obviously, as you've heard this before, when he looked at her the first time, he said, whoa, man. He was impressed. And I think God designed it that way. In, so, in doing so, God illustrated what an important role women, wives, and mother were going to play in all of human history. God designed the two genders to share his characteristics. Once again, part of God being given to the personality and the mental makeup of the male and verse uh, the same for the woman, he gave certain characteristics in greater proportion to the man, certain characteristics in greater proportion to the woman. Let's continue, verse 24, we're in Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So the marriage bond was designed from the beginning to make the two as one person, as one, when they are enjoined in marriage. When Jesus Christ was questioned whether it was okay for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason. What was his reply? I won't turn, but Matthew 19, verse 6. Jesus said, and he's repeating this from Genesis, he says, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Let no one come between a bond of marriage, a lifelong bond of marriage between a man and a woman. Again, that was by design from the beginning. The passage shows that God's design in the ideal was that marriages would be lifelong, a commitment between a man and a woman. It also alludes to something else. It alludes to the idea that like opposite ends of a magnet attract each other, that a man and a woman would have a natural attraction and a healthy relationship and even grow closer over the years of marriage. That again was by design from the beginning. And yes, we understand that the unfortunate reality is that not every marriage has been able to follow the ideal, and yet still God works with our human shortcomings to guide us to eternal spirit life in this period of time, in this age of humanity in which so many other bombardments of, 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 of just things that tear families apart. This is all going to change in the millennial years when human beings will still be flesh and blood, they'll still marry, they'll still have children, they'll grow up and have children, we'll have children for a thousand years. But they'll have the education that most of this world has lacked since Adam and Eve. Now Matthew 22 verse 30, again another reference here, Jesus speaks about this design from the beginning. He says, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. Spirit beings will not have a marriage relationship except for marriage with the Lamb of God, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Please turn to Psalm 139 verse 13 with me. Psalm 139 verse 13. 
Here, David expresses in this psalm how aware he was about the thought and the engineering and the planning that went into creating human beings. David explains in his musings, his meditation, his prayer to God, he says in Psalm 139, verse 13, for you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul, and that, I emphasize the word, and that my soul knows very well. I wanted to be sure the translation actually uh, meant that. And we're marvelously made and that I know very well, David says. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God had plans from the beginning for David. He would steer his life, and he would maneuver his life, much like he did with uh, other prophets, namely Jeremiah, who was called before his birth, to be a prophet of God. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. He's saying, isn't this amazing, God, that you take so much time and attention and concern for humanity as you do? The passage speaks to the physical formation of David while he was in his mother's womb and his limbs were being formed and his fingers and toes and so forth. But David would also have marveled at the intellectual capacity of human mind as well. Let's go back to Psalm 8 and verse 3. Psalm 8 and verse 3. David ponders the great potential that God designed in the human humanity. The great potential here. Let's read Psalm 8, verses 3 through 5. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have ordained, what is man that you should be mindful of him? And the son of man that you should visit him, that you should take time God to spend so much attention on human beings. Of course, we know that humanity is God's pinnacle of creation and that God has incredible potential and plans for his human creation. Verse five, you made him a little lower than the angels at this time. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Now we know that when we get into the New Testament, we see that God has a great spiritual uh, potential, once again, that was not fully revealed in the Old Testament, but that God has great plans in store for human beings as they are in the spirit bodies. Again, the beauty of the contrast between the male and female mind and the beauty of a healthy, happy human relationship between the sexes brings God glory. A female, on the one hand, God said to Eve, Genesis 3.16, your desire shall be toward your husband. By design, the wife shows her support for the male, for the husband, by holding him up. And his identity becomes rooted in her strength. His identity becomes rooted in the wife's strength. She invests her strength in her husband, which brings honor back to her. There's a phrase in a song that many of you will remember. It was sung in the 70s and 80s at many weddings. It was by Paul Stuckey. He was the pop band member of Peter, Paul, and Mary. You'll remember that group name probably better than Paul Stuckey. I had to look it up. Many in my generation will remember. This song came out in 1969 titled, There Is Love. It's also called The Wedding Song. One line in here, always struck me as a beautiful line. Now, Paul Stuckey wrote this song for Peter, the other band member who was getting married, and he wrote this as a wedding song at that marriage. 
the phrase goes, as it was in the beginning, is now until the end. Woman draws her life from man and gives it back again. It's just a beautiful phrase. It's poetic. And this is true. A woman is generally wired for nurturing, support, and exaltation of her husband and her family. The male, on the other hand, by design is physically stronger, bolder, a little more fearless than women as a rule, and is designed to follow the pattern of laying down his life to protect his wife's purity in a godly marriage and a selfless act and protect her femininity because she is to be a prize to him. This is how God ideally designed it to be. He is generally wired to be a more aggressive in which he is geared up for activity and defense and protection of his family. The fascinating differences to God's glory between, again, the male and the female mind and personality and way of thinking, the French would say, vive la différence, long live the difference. Again, a wonderful uniqueness between the two. In the famous line from the My Fair Lady play and then later movie, you remember? Professor Henry Higgins, or as, uh, as she would say, Henry Higgins, just you wait, Henry Higgins, you remember that? Well, the famous line was, why can't a woman be more like a man in the song? Well, the fact of the matter is, and the movie portrays very clearly toward the end of the story, a man wouldn't be interested in a woman if she were more like a man. It took the whole movie for him to come to realize this. Audrey Hepburn is transformed in this movie to a very rough young lady into something refined and feminine and poised and graceful. And it starts to uh, get to the emotions of Professor Higgins. And he's confused and he's struggling with his emotions toward the end of the movie. He's obviously finding her very attractive in many ways. And so that's, that's the mystique in the movie that is portrayed so well. Again, it's because the sexes were designed in the image of God to have their uniqueness to God's glory. There is some mystique that makes a man and a woman intrigued with each other's differences. And that God designed, designed or decided that all the variety of being human, again, God shared part of his own image and likeness, a little more for the man, and part of his image and likeness a little more for the woman. Because uh, they could not all be packaged in one mind and body. I won't turn, Proverbs 30, verse 19. Proverbs 30, verse 19, it says, there are three things that are too amazing for me. And one of those was the way of a man with a maiden. The intrigue, the appeal, the allure between the two. Now let's, for the remainder of this message, take a look at some of the beautiful attributes of motherhood. Something God designed uniquely in the woman's role. God created the role of mothers for a reason. And that is to care for and nurture, both physically and mentally. She is wired for that. She's geared for that. God created that uh, attribute more for a woman's role. No one has more influence on the psychological development of a child in the first young years of a child than the mother. That's a known fact. I mean, there's no debate on that one. She is the baby's security, comforter, nurturer, and provider. Not very many men are wired to do the same, maybe a few. It might be a silly question, and it's a rhetorical one. I, I remember seeing something years ago. I looked for it on the internet to see if I could see a statistical uh, conclusion to this statement I'm going to make right now. Have you ever pondered how long a healthy, balanced society would survive without motherhood? Now, I know it's, it, again, it's a rhetorical question. It'll never happen. 
in this human life and this human existence, but what if there was a way to sustain reproduction and there were only men on the earth? Now, I know you see some weird things going on right now where, yeah, men can get pregnant. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is just twisted, mangled ideas that people have in their imaginations. So let's put that aside. But if there was a way to sustain productivity of the human race without mothers caring for and instructing children in manners, in politeness, in compassion, how to care for a newborn baby, making the home the very focal center of family life, what would happen, I submit to you within a generation, it would be absolute disaster. <laughs> I really think so. There'd be a total collapse of civilization if men were managing the earth without women. I think the same could be true the other way around. But I've heard the question posed, and again, I believe that within a generation, the qualities of civilization would just be gone. They'd be gone. Again, it's a ridiculous idea, but just food for thought. Let's go to a spiritual level. God created motherhood to give humanity insight into the role of our perfect parent, God, our Father, in heaven. It's through mothers that we can understand some of the distinct characteristics of God, both the Father and the Son. We're told in John 1, verse 18, that Jesus Christ came to the earth to reveal the Father. Let me share a few attributes of the Father, or Father and Son, God, let's say, toward the unique qualities of motherhood. I mentioned to you that God took part of himself in his likeness and his image to create the male personality and mindset and part of himself for the female personality and mindset. Listen to these few short passages from the scriptures. Psalm 56 verse 8 says, God knows every tear that we have ever cried. Isaiah 63 verse 9 tells us, it is God who carries us in love and pity. Isaiah 42 verse 6 tells us, it is God who takes us by the hand. It is God who suffers when we suffer, Hosea 11 verse 8, and who shields us under the shadow of his wings, Psalm 36 verse 7. I submit most men are just not wired to the same degree to do these things as a woman is. One more, Isaiah 66 verse 13, God says, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You see some of the nurturing and comforting attributes of God. Uh, Jesus Christ was masculine in the perfect image of God's design for men. And yet he also had a tenderness and a compassion. He likened Jerusalem going astray. Uh, he says in Luke 13, verse 34, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you are not willing. That is a beautiful, compassionate thought that Jesus Christ shared, and yet he was a masculine person in God's exact image and design. Mothers are priceless teachers and guides for children. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, and let's do turn there just very briefly. For 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, Paul is writing this letter to young Timothy. And before he says this, he says he understands Timothy's tears. He longs to visit him again and see him again. Timothy was the young charge of Paul. Paul was his mentor. 2 Timothy, uh, Timothy 1, verse 5, it says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it is in you also. The interesting note here is that there's no mention of fathers in the passage. 
I'm not saying he didn't have an influence of a father, but there's no mention here. Paul gives credit to two generations of women in Timothy's life for passing on the genuine faith. In just this short passage, we can see a powerful godly influence. A grandmother and a mother both had in a child's upbringing, spiritual upbringing. Moms play an important role just as fathers do. I won't turn, but Proverbs 1, verse 8. It says, My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Both, the father and the mother, have an important role in the spiritual guidance of a child. And that is by God's design. In the early chapters of Proverbs, you see wisdom being depicted allegorically as a female. Proverbs 3, verse 18, it says, she, this is wisdom as a female, she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her, who retain wisdom. We're living in an age where a very radical, radicalized stage of Western culture is in decline. We're living in that age of decline, but God's word transcends history, it transcends culture, it transcends the social climate of the day. Any social movement in our culture, whether it's feminism, I'm the radical ones, the radical ones, feminism, gay rights movement, one of the newest distortions of God's design for humanity, gender identity. I mentioned earlier that there are people that are somehow imagining a, a, a man bringing a child through gestation to birth. I mean, like, it's like gender fluidity, ideology, that there are 74 genders. I had to look this up. And there was a website that looked like it was very professionally written by doctors and psychologists and had their endorsement. It actually listed alphabetically A through Z, 74 different so-called genders between male and female. And it's pathetic because it looked quite professional in its language and its position that it took. Uh, or the suggestion that men and women are more alike than they are different, or that either half is all that's needed in the world. We don't need the other gender in this world. I mean, these are all sad, tragic, misguided ideas, and they are forms of blasphemy. They are forms of blasphemy because they go against what God designed for male and female from the beginning. And yet you and I have the privilege of not getting caught up in all that human imagination gone astray. Proverbs 29, verse 18, I won't turn again a reference, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no revelation. What happens? People cast off restraint, but blessed are those who heed wisdom's instruction. We're so blessed to know these things. Please turn to Ephesians 5. And verse 1 for my final passage, Ephesians 5, verse 1. Ephesians 5, verse 1, here as you're turning, God has provided humankind with this, his unchangeable truths. Again, established at the creation that men and women are the only two genders. And that each one was designed to have an interdependency on the other and to offer support to one another, and ultimately in the context of family and marriage. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God, dear children, as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Skipping to verse 21. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body of believers. Verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself to her, or for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, meaning the church, with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Most of us recall these beautiful words at every wedding ceremony you have ever been to in God's church. What beautiful imagery. There's a balance and a wholesomeness that occurs when a man and a woman learn to work together through life when they become one flesh, ultimately, when there's an attraction, a natural attraction between male and female. And Paul is using a physical parallel to show the love within a marriage to be like the love that Jesus Christ has for his church and that his church reciprocates to him. A woman is to present herself pure to her husband. The husband is to nurture her through treating her honorably and by protecting her femininity. The man is to show love to his wife by his godly leadership and protection of her honor. To conclude, in the final thoughts on the wonderful differences between men and women, we are truly, fearfully, and wonderfully made. Marriage in this physical life is an intense schoolroom or classroom for growing and in the giving to one another and sharing and learning patient forbearance for learning communica communication skills, and learning how to love one another. And although not every person called and converted will marry in this physical lifetime, again, marriage can be a wonderful good training ground for our future marriage with the Lamb of God, the spiritual bond with Jesus Christ that we will have for all eternity. In our appreciation for womanhood and the honoring of motherhood this weekend, Happy Mother's Day to all the moms here today.